ship as huge as this has something of the natural grandeur of a mountain peak. It's difficult to realize that there was a time when it didn't exist. A time when someone, somewhere, made the decision to build it. This is the square mile of the city of London, which in the modern world does duty for Tyre and Sidon, Carthage and Babylon. A place where exotic dealings proceed behind discreetly non-committal classical facades. A place where big decisions are no novelty at all. Here it was, on a day in September 1955, that a board meeting had been called at which the decision would be made, or perhaps not made, to order the largest passenger liner to be built in Britain since the war. The chairman's car passes under an arch built when Clive and Warren Hastings were recent memories. And upstairs, the preparations in the boardroom are inspected by the chief messenger. He's done it often enough before, and how should he know that this time his carefully arranged room will see a decision to back belief in the future of sea trade in a peaceful world with 16 million pounds? But in 1955, what a world it was. would be a good deal graver if no one were prepared to back our trade with courage and wisdom. Inside the boardroom, it's all over, and the debris of decision gives the tidying messengers a little glimpse of the minds at work round the table. Hard-headed facts and figures man. The man to whom the neatly tabulated data added up to the word Australia. And, rather unexpectedly, the visionary who's left a streamlined record beater ready designed on his pad. Once the die is cast and a bid from a shipbuilder approved, the proceedings are surprisingly informal. The chairman calls a meeting in his office and passes the successful tender to the deputy chairman, who's supported not only by the managing director, but by the designers both of the hull and of the engines. The men of action are taking over. The chairman's secretary brings in a letter for signature. Quite an ordinary letter too. No stamps, seals, witnesses or multiple signature. Just, dear Sir Frederick, this is to confirm the meeting which took place this morning between Mr. Bailey, Dr. Rebeck, Mr. Cameron and ourselves on the subject of the tender you've put forward for our new Australian passenger ship. And 400 miles away in Belfast, the chairman of the builders takes on a great responsibility and 20,000 of the most experienced shipbuilders in the world roll up their sleeves. Long gone are the days when the naval architect could indulge his fancy in the design of a new hull. Now the performance of a wax model in a tank has far-reaching effects on the decisions, both of the naval architect and of the designer responsible for the engines of the new ship. This is still only the first chapter of the story, and as yet, no one has even thought of a name for the ship that only exists on paper. It's still only a picture in the minds of these men whose duty it is to preside over the great human effort that will make a ship, stately and individual, out of a heap of plans labelled 1621. You can't order a ship's plates as a builder orders bricks. You have first to mark out the exact shape on a model of the hull, and then draw them out full scale in a vast loft that looks like nothing so much as a roller skating rink. Actually, it's a giant tailor's shop. Paper patterns, as it were, for 40-foot steel plates weighing 10 tons apiece. This is the new ship's berth. 
empty and still for the last time for two and a half years to come. And these are the men who will build her. Impersonal, unidentified faces that the years ahead will focus into personal, individual men. Like Bill Duncan, the crane driver, who sees more than most of a new ship from his perch among the clouds. Bill's a bit of a philosopher. Here we go again, up 500 steps. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. This should be a fine ship. Quite a keel plate too, at five tons. Well, one, six, two, one. Here we go. Each morning, 20,000 of us stream in through the yard gates and fan out into little groups inside. Our gang usually stop to chat for a minute or two and then off I go up my ladder and no one can say a word to me for the rest of the day. I've been a crane driver for 20 years, mostly five days a week. Odds up to a long time I've spent alone in the cab without a soul to speak to. Think of it, I might be a black leg and get sent to Coventry. That'd be a lot. Come on, make your mind up. Easy now. Well, down. Up. Stop. Easy. We ought to learn deaf and dumb language, then we we'll could tell each other what we really think. The ship called 1621 isn't being built plate by plate, rivet by rivet, but is rather being tailored out of metal by the flaming swords of the welding machine. In this second half of the 20th century, a single prefabricated section of bulkhead may be as big as some of the ships that sailed with Hawkins to the Indies. likeness between men who work metal the world across, a brotherhood perhaps, to use a hard-worked word, that pays but scant respect to history. And even now, a thousand miles from Belfast, in the glare and racket of a foundry at Bochum, West Germany, Hans Joachim Hecker is reflecting that 20 years ago he was at sea on no peaceful mission. And now he has the task of building a merchant marine of the future alongside unseen friends in every corner of the world. From the Bochum foundry come the huge brackets that will support the shafts of the two 29-ton bronze propellers of 1621. Funny thing about that shop in Germany who used to be a sailor. Those air brackets are pretty unusual outside of warships. All right, all right, I'm watching you. The ship will be driven by electric motors and the current for them will come from the turbo alternators built in this factory at Rugby. Watchmaking is one thing, one might suppose, and 85,000 horsepower engines quite another. But here the two of them meet, 
as the ponderous turbine casing eases down inch by inch. Five thousand horsepower is a lot of power, however you look at it. And the shafts that have to carry the torque of those huge engines must be tremendous. But still, the standards and measurements of the watchmaker are observed along that great pillar of steel. She's beginning to look down on the yard buildings all around. She's growing up and up all the time. And all the time she's getting nearer to me, I suppose. But I've still got 500 steps to climb. of a West Highland mountainside provide the power to make aluminium out of bauxite from Ghana. A long river of metal flowing from the rolling mills like the water from the hills outside. Until not so long ago, it was almost impossible to weld aluminium successfully and difficult enough to paint it. Intensive research and experiment led to the discovery of techniques to deal with both problems. And so, almost the whole superstructure of 1621 could be confidently designed in aluminium and welded aluminium at that. of 1621 superstructure from the towering bridge to the smooth contours of the first class swimming pool is the secret of her great carrying capacity far greater than that of older ships with more impressive tonnage a very special feature will eventually be hidden below the sea the bulbous bow designed to ease her passage through the water whilst the ingenious bow propeller for maneuvering and the twin pairs of stabilizers combine with the great mass of more conventional equipment to make sure that this great ship will be something of which every man concerned with her building can be rightly proud. The heavy timbers of the slipway are singed dry and coated with tallow, ready for the now no longer distant day 
When the enormous hull will begin to move, inch by inch at first, then feet, yards, and in the end, mile after endless mile around the world, as far even as the distant harbour of Vancouver, under the shadow of the Canadian Rockies. In a few years from now, a short, stocky British Columbia stevedore, whose name is Jack, and who at this moment has never even heard of a project called 1621, will be handling at this same dockside one of the greatest ships in the world. Jack is a full-blooded Indian, and his grandfather paddled his canoe in Vancouver Harbour before the first steamers came west around Cape Horn. The ship will be number 1621, but then it will have a name. I was eating my dinner up on the crane and the rest of the lads had just knocked off for theirs too. When we heard the rumour that old 1621 had got herself a name, the chairman himself had come out to have a look. And there was enough oil brass all over the yard to make a fireman's helmet. So it was reckoned to be a good rumour. Canberra it was to be, after the capital of Australia. And there she was, all ready for the christening. Well, that's not the right word, of course. But I had got christening on my mind a bit, as the new baby was to be christened on the Sunday before luncheon. And after all the fuss and preparation at home on the leg pulling by the lads, I hardly knew whether we were christening the ship or launching the baby. When Australia named her new capital, Canberra, the meeting place, this great ship lay in the distant future. But a meeting place for thousands she has indeed become today, as she lies, brilliant in her new paint, under the pale Northern Ireland skies, waiting for Dame Patty Menzies, wife of the Australian Prime Minister, to perform the launching ceremony. I name this ship Canberra. May God protect her and all who sail in her. years ago she was a piece of steel marked 1621. Now she's a ship and on her own. May the years bring her luck and may our passengers think sometimes of the men who built and launched her here in our city of Belfast.